good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending the TAT this afternoon. I think most of the faces look familiar to me. I've seen you in ICU. Um, if I haven't met you, I'm Anna Lena Dutoy. I'm one of the dietitians that, that work in ICU. <clears throat> so today is the first um, I'm doing with you for the year. I think we'll do about three of you throughout the course with you throughout the course of the year. So I thought it would be a good place to start with nutritional screening and optimization, maybe as that is the first um, step in the screening is the first step in the nutrition care um, pathway. So just in terms of what we will be covering today, <clears throat> so we'll look at nutrition screening and assessment and the difference between the two. Then we'll um, look at refeeding hyperphosphatemia and refeeding syndrome. Then we'll touch on the requirements in ICU, um, especially with regards to when to start and, and what route we use when. And then we'll look at nutrition in the perioperative um, period, um, specifically in relation to what the ESPEN surgical guidelines um, tell us to do. So just in terms of, of nutrition screening, so nutrition screening is a rapid and simple process. It screens for the risk of malnutrition. It does not screen for malnutrition itself. Um, it's conducted by any staff uh, member of the, of the multidisciplinary um, team or even um, like a ward clerk should be able to, to do it. And ideally, all patients should be screened on admission to a healthcare facility, which is, of course, um, not something that's really happening in, in our setting, but that is the ideal. So if we look at the outcome of nutrition screening, um, that will then give us a defined course of action of what we need to do with that patient. And there's basically four kind of categories of patients that, that you kind of come out, of, out with. So the first one is the patient that's not at risk. And that patient may require rescreening because it might change um, through the, the um, IC or through the, the hospital stay. So that might be a patient that gets admitted for elective surgery in a good, good nutritional state. On admission, that patient is not at risk, but if that surgery should complicate or the patient get, uh, develops an ileus or a leak or something like that, it might change in a, in a week's time. Then we get the patient that is at risk, but that patient will probably be okay with a standard um, care plan. Then we get the patient that, it, that is at risk that will need specialized input. And then we get the ones where there's a question mark as, um, as regards to whether the patient is at risk or not. And it's really the last two categories where um, the dietitian then gets involved and we, we, we will take the process um, forward. So in, in terms of the components of screening, there's basically four components. So the first question that screening asks is, what is the condition now? And that we can do based on the patient's BMI. We can do it based on um, mid-upper arm circumference, especially in, in children and pregnant people. Um, and there's other methods by which we can um, determine things like muscle mass um, and um, or then body composition. Then the second question it asks is, is this condition stable? So as the patient has re had recent changes in weight, and especially important there is your patients that come um, with obesity and whether or not they have lost weight in the last, in the last period. We currently have um, a patient in D12 in the unit that his injury was in November. And although he's still currently has a raised BMI, um, he has probably lost condition over the, the, um, over the months um, since November when he, when he had his initial injury. So it's important to, to look at what the patient's um, condition was before, before they got sick. Will the condition get worse? So is there maybe changes in appetite or intake or the patient's ability to, to actually um, voluntarily take food? And then will the disease process accelerate the deterioration of the, of the patient? So will the disease state of the patient increase the, their requirements? For instance, something like surgery or patient admitted to ICU, a patient with intestinal failure, but then also our patients with um, infectious diseases like HIV or TB. Is it something that's going to, to accelerate the, the, the weight loss or decline in nutritional status? So if we look at um, screening tools, um, there's some ESPEN recommended screening tools for adults, and it, it really depends 
on the setting where you are going to use the, the screening tool for in hospital um, the NRS 2002 screening tool um, has been validated for use. Um, so that's the one that we that we use mostly. And the NRS basically looks like this. So it starts off by asking you four questions. Is the BMI less, less than 20? Has the patient lost weight within the last three months? Has the patient had a reduction in his intake? Or is the patient severely ill? And if you answer yes to any of those four questions, you then go on to, to screen the patient further, <clears throat> which then looks at the um, impaired nutritional status and the severity of their disease. And you're going to score them then according to how bad their nutritional state is or how bad the severity of the disease is. And then the patient um, over 70 will score an extra one um, for, for age. So if you look at this, you'll see that a patient that is in ICU will already score three on his um, severity of disease scores. And if we look at how um, NRS classifies patients, a score of, of more than or equal to three, say that a patient is nutritionally at risk and that a nutrition care plan is needed. So actually every single patient that we screen with this tool in ICU is going to get at least a three, which says every single patient in ICU is at, at risk of, of malnutrition. Okay, and that is exactly what the ESPEN guideline also says. Every critically ill patient staying for more than 48 hours in the ICU should be considered as at risk for malnutrition. When we look at the ESPEN um, the recommendation, so if you're not that familiar with ESPEN and ESPEN, so ESPEN is the um, American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, ESPEN is the European Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. Um, we tend to follow the, the ESPEN guidelines a little bit closer just because the product availability uh, between Europe and, and what we have here is a little bit more similar, especially when it comes to, to PN products. Um, and you'll see that they, there's a difference, um, especially in, in when to start PN as we, as we go further on. So we, um, we like the ESPEN guidelines a little, bit, a little bit more. So the ESPEN guidelines suggest um, a deterioration, a determination of, of nutrition risk should be performed on all patients admitted to ICU who will not be able to, to take um, sufficient um, the orally um, on their own. So basically every single patient that comes into the unit that, um, that is, is intubated at least won't, won't be able to eat. So how do we assess then for malnutrition in these patients? So um, the ESPEN guidelines recommends a general clinical assessment um, should be performed until um, a malnutrition tool for ICU has been validated. So they suggest that we look at unintentional weight loss, a reduction in physical performance status, and then assessment of body composition and muscle mass or strength, <clears throat> if that is possible. So that would be through something like bioelectrical impedance um, or CT scan, if, we, if that, we have that available, or something simple like um, a hand grip strength um, measurement, for instance. The, oh, sorry. There is also the um, subjective global assessment that you can use for, for assessing your patient for, for, mal for malnutrition. It looks at eight components. So the one at the top is weight loss. And then um, you've got the trend in, in the patient's weight, you've got gastrointestinal symptoms, the functional state of the patient, um, the, the disease state that affects nutritional requirements, muscle wastage, fat stores, and then the presence of edema that's related um, to nutrition. And then you score that patient, the lower the score, the more severely malnourished um, the patient will be. We don't particularly use these scores in, in ICU or in the hospital to score patients. We're not going to write in our notes, patient is a SGA 4 or 5 or whatever. But we take all of these components um, into consideration when we do our nutrition assessment um, on the patient. And, and that's how we will then sometimes um, say this patient is, is more malnourished or at a higher risk than the guy in, in the bed um, next, next door. All right, so then just to touch on GLIM, which is quite a, a new concept um, in, in nutrition. So it's the Global Leadership Initiative on Malnutrition. 
Um, so basically a whole lot of the of countries came together and said, let's come up with a single approach by which we diagnose malnutrition so that when I say I've got this amount of, of this percentage of my population is malnourished, I speak the same language as the person in the States or the person in, in Europe so that we can, or all over the world for that matter, so that we can compare um, data and we're all comparing apples with apples. So the GLIM approach is a, is a two-step approach. So it consists of screening, which screens for risk of malnutrition, and then assessment, which is the diagnosis or the grading of, of malnutrition. So it has three phenotypic criteria. So the one is non-volitional loss of weight, then there's a reduction in BMI and reduction in muscle mass. And you can use any of these three to classify your patient then um, according to, to their malnutrition. So if you are in a setting where you don't have any fancy equipment, you could just do BMI. If you are in a setting where you are lucky enough to have access to CT scans or you can have access to a DEXA scan, which we probably won't do just for diagnosis of malnutrition, but patients might have had that. Or if you've got access to something like bioelectrical impedance, you can use a fancier method of, of classifying your patient if, if you want to call it um, if you want to call it that. And then there's two ideological criteria. So it's either reduction in intake or assimilation. Or the so this basically then gives you the reason for the malnutrition. So is it that the patient is taking in less or able to absorb less of his food, or is it inflammation or disease burden that that is driving the the, um, the reduction in intake? And something for instance like um, poor household food security will also fall under reduced intake. So it's not just focusing on on what we know as diseases that might influence um, intake and assimilation, it's also looking a little bit broader. So then um, you're going to classify your patient as stage one or stage two malnourished. So you can choose which one of the phenotypic criteria you are going to use, but if you are using more than one, you will classify the patient based on the worst one. Okay. So if I've got a patient that has lost 5% of his body weight in the last six months, for instance, um, that patient there for weight loss falls as a stage one. But if the patient has a BMI of 16, that puts him as a stage two on BMI. So you classify him according to his worst parameter that, that you've got access to. And then you choose uh, um, ethological criteria that then gives you a little a bit of perspective on why your patient has got um, this, this reduction in in body mass or nutritional status. Okay, so if we just go through it stepwise, so in terms of screening tools and assessment, you can use something like the NRS, which we which we went um, through. There's also the Nutrix score, which is mentioned in the ASPA guideline. The Nutrix score consists of six um, parameters. It looks at things like Apache score and SOFA score. It's actually got not a single nutritional parameter um, in. It all looks at um, kind of the disease severity and then says that the patient who's got a higher disease severity is probably going to benefit more from early nutritional intervention than somebody that, that's got a lower disease severity. Then in terms of assessment, we can use either the SGA or a general assessment, which we've spoken about. <clears throat> and then you're going to classify your patient. Um, and the severity will be based on the phenotypic criteria and then the etiological criteria prov provides the context and guides the, the intervention that is needed for the patient. So what's important to remember is that risk of malnutrition is not necessarily equal to existing malnutrition. And that all ICU patients are at risk of malnutrition and we shouldn't wait for them to become malnourished before we do something um, something about it. So it's important to do that screening and pick up those patients um, early. All right, so then if we move on to refeeding syndrome, any of you familiar with the term and the concept and how it works? Anybody want to volunteer an answer? <laughs> Yes, so it's, it shifts in your in your electrolytes and especially in, in your phosphate. So phosphate is the surrogate marker for, for um, refeeding syndrome. Thank you for that. 
So if we starve a patient, your glucose levels will decrease within 20, or any person for that matter, will decrease within um, 24 to 72 hours. You will then have an increase in glucagon and a decrease in insulin, which um, will then make use of um, glycogenolysis to provide you with, with enough um, glucose. But those stores are depleted with about, within about 72 hours maximum. So then the body, body will go over um, into gluconeogenesis to provide um, the, the body with enough glucose. If you staff a healthy volunteer, they will drop their metabolic rate so that they use less, and they will get majority of what they need through glycogenesis from um, fat stores within the body. If you do the same to a patient in an in a ICU, they don't only lose body fat, they also, or any sick patient for that matter, they also lose protein and they deplete the electrolytes, their trace elements, and their, and their vitamins. So if you imagine that this is the serum at the back, the red, and the cell in the middle with your electrolytes floating around there. When we give these patients glucose, and that glucose can be in any form, it's the dextrose containing IV fluid that, that gets put up as just the IV fluid. It's the enteral feed that we might um, give the patient. It's PN that we might give the patient. It's what a patient might eat um, suddenly. So any increase in glucose will lead to a decrease in glucagon and an increase in your insulin. That insulin will then move that glucose from the serum into the cell. And with it, it takes a whole lot of, of your electrolytes. Um, then you, so you, you, le you then lose phosphate, or, no, sorry. So that leads to, to um, insulin resistance, which is, is not that well described. But at the level of the kidney, you then get retention of water and sodium. And then, so now you get a patient with high sodium, fluid overload, and, and um, a decrease in the serum electrolyte levels. Then you are going to phosphorylate ADP to ATP, which will then again use um, some of your, your phosphate and drop that further. And thiamine is a cofactor in that um, process. So you will get a reduction in thiamine, which will then um, or can then um, contribute to lactic acidosis. So at the end of the day, you get the patient with deranged electrolytes, fluid overload, a high sodium, insulin resistance, um, and, and acidosis due to, to a thiamine deficiency. So the um, refeeding syndrome is an umbrella term for all of these derangement that, that can happen within a patient. And um, hyperphosphatemia is the, is the hallmark feature. So if we look at the definition for, for refeeding hyperphosphatemia, there's a few, um, but kind of the, the most well-accepted one is a serum phosphate level that drops to below 0.65 within 72 hours of instituting um, dextrose or glucose therapy in a patient through whichever route, or a decrease of more than 0.16 millimoles per liter from any previous level. So if you've got a patient who had a phosphate of 1.5 and you start feeds on that patient and it's 0.9 tomorrow, although it's still within the normal range, that is, is a worrying shift in a patient who you think was maybe at risk of knowledge of, of refeeding syndrome. Um, and that, that's then enough to, to um, institute a, a refeeding protocol. Um, so if we look at all the biochemical abnormalities in the clinical manifestations, I, I think it basically affects most um, organ, organ systems in the body um, through these electrolyte shifts and the fluid overload. What's important to remember is that refeeding hyperphosphatemia is not the same as refeeding syndrome. So the syndrome is when you end up with that patient that we described before with the lactic acidosis, with the, um, the fluid overload, the high sodium, the insulin resistance, whereas refeeding hyperphosphatemia is a is something that we can observe in a patient and then we can adjust the, the nutrition plan so that we don't push that patient into, into refeeding syndrome. Okay. So if we look at the incidence of refeeding syndrome, there's no universal definition, which makes it difficult to, to really gather um, literature across um, all kinds of disciplines. What we do know is that it's frequently underdiagnosed and still um, denied by, by a lot of, of um, people within the clinical field. 
it is very common in malnourished patients with the incidence of about 30 to 50 percent in hospitalized patients so this is a this is a summary of um studies that has looked at um at the incidence of, of wheat feeding hypophosphatemia or wheat feeding syndrome um, and you can see it's across studies, it's across, um, it's across disciplines, it's, it's patients in ICU, it's patients with fistulas, it's patients on PN or EN. And then they also looked at when they dropped it and the incidence ranges anything from between 2% um, up to 80% in, in some of these studies. So we'll just touch on some of them in a little bit more detail. So the study looked at the incidence of refeeding syndrome in internal medicine patients. Um, so they looked at all patients admitted to internal medicine over a two month period. Um, they used the NICE criteria, which um, has specific criteria for um, defining a patient at high or moderate, moderate risk for, for um, refeeding syndrome. Um, they used hypophosphatemia as the main indicator and they included 178 patients. 54% of those patients were considered at risk of um, refeeding syndrome, of which 14 out of 97 developed um, refeeding syndrome. And one patient that was not considered as a risk also developed refeeding syndrome, which made it 8.5% of patients out of the total um, amount of patients included. And they found that current or previous malignancy increased the risk um, or the likelihood of a patient developing refeeding syndrome. <clears throat> the next study um, looked at refeeding hypophosphatemia in the intensive care unit. It was a retrospective medical record review that included 117 patients, and they defined hypophosphatemia as less than 0.77 millimoles per liter, or then severe hypophosphatemia as less than 0.32. They recorded refeeding in 52% of patients, with 10% of patients presenting with severe um, hypophosphatemia. So, and that's already one unit of D12 a day as, as refeeding, so it, it is quite um, prevalent. Um, then this patient looked, uh, the study looked at entry fed patients in the surgical ICU. Again, a retrospective um, record review. They included 213 patients, of which 39% um, developed refeeding hypophosphatemia. Um, then this study looked at the occurrence of refeeding syndrome in patients who started artificial nutrition support, so that was EN or PN. It was a prospective cohort study that included 243 patients. 55% of them had one or more than one risk factor for refeeding syndrome. And this, this was a study within a study, so some patients were um, restricted in terms of the amount of calories that, that they were given, which might have influenced the amount of patients that actually developed refeeding um, hypophosphatemia because you were trying to an extent to prevent it. So um, looking at day one, 3% of patients had low serum phosphate, and by day three, 6% of patients had a low serum phosphate. 2% developed refeeding syndrome, which included that whole electrolyte shift and clinical symptoms and, and organ dysfunction. This is a, another study in 2017. It was a, re a retrospective study of medical surgical ICU patients who were, who were ventilated for more than seven days. They included 337 patients and they used the definition of refeeding syndrome as I, I gave it to you in the beginning. Um, we'll go a little bit further into this study later, but what they found was that 37% of patients developed um, refeeding syndrome. Then this is another study from 2018, a prospective observational study in a medical ICU where patients were admitted for more than 48 hours and started on enteral nutrition. Um, they included 109 patients and they used the same definition for, for refeeding hypophosphatemia. And they found that 40% of patients pre, um, presented with a decrease in their, in their phosphate levels. <clears throat> so um, once, oh, this, this um, is another 2017 study, the one that we, that we spoke about before. Um, so these patients were put into two groups, the ones that developed refeeding syndrome and the ones that didn't. And then those groups were split into providing them with low calorie or high calorie intake within um, the first three days of, of admission. So if we look at these graphs, you will see the green bar is the patient um, with refeeding syndrome. The blue one is the one without. 
So what you what we see here is that the serum phosphate levels for the patients with refeeding syndrome was lower, which is kind of expected. And then on the next graph there, you'll see that they required more phosphate replacement, which is also not a surprise. Um, <clears throat> on this one, it shows us the potassium dose of patients that developed refeeding syndrome also required more potassium replacement. And then the patients with refeeding syndrome also required a higher dose of insulin. And that's because of that insulin resistance um, that, goes, that goes with um, refeeding syndrome. Then this is the survival graph for, for these patients. So you'll see the blue and the green bar in the middle are the patients who didn't, who didn't develop refeeding syndrome. The yellow bar at the top are patients that developed refeeding syndrome, but their calories were restricted. So they were treated according to a refeeding kind of protocol, if you want to call it that. Whereas the ones at the bottom in the red developed refeeding syndrome and their nutrition just carried on. They weren't, they weren't put on a, on a refeeding protocol. And you can see that their survival was the poorest um, out of the lot. And interestingly is that the split happens um, yeah, at around two weeks, which is not really that the patient would have developed his refeeding syndrome much earlier. He would have developed it probably within the first three days. Um, but there's something that happens then later on in these patients that would make the, the survival worse. This is another 2015 study which did something similar. So once they've identified patients as, um, as refeeding hyperphosphatemia, they restricted the, the calories to 20 calories um, per hour for 48 hours, which is equivalent to running a one calorie per mole feed at 20 moles um, per hour. And then if the phosphate normalized, they went up to 40, 60, 80, and then by day four, they got to 100% of the patient's goal. So um, <clears throat> the red bar here is the patients that that um, received standard care. So in other words, they weren't restricted in terms of their calories. Um, and then the blue bar is the patients who was treated according to, to this refeeding protocol. So you can see that the patients um, with, who, who were not restricted had lower phosphate um, levels and required more phosphate replacement, especially there between day one and two. And then in terms of their blood glucose, the patients who were not restricted had much higher blood glucose levels than the patients who were treated according to the, to the refeeding protocol because of the, the insulin resistance that we see. Um, and then also their lactate was a lot, a lot higher because of the lactic acidosis that they developed due to, to thiamine depletion. Mm -hmm. Again, if we look at the survival, the patients, the, the red bar at the bottom is the standard case of the patients that were not put onto a refeeding protocol when they developed the, the hyperphosphatemia. And then the one at the top that shows a much better survival are the ones that were managed according to the restricted um, calorie management. And again, there you can see that the split happens at about two weeks into their into the stay. <clears throat> so how do we manage these patients? So we need to to supplement the, the electrolytes. Glucose monitoring um, needs to be done to prevent hyper and hypoglycemia. They need um, insulin administration um, if they have hyperglycemia. We need to correct the fluid overload if necessary and if possible, I suppose. Um, we need to give them thiamine to compensate for, for the, the decrease in their thiamine levels. <clears throat> and then we need to restrict the calories. So, Works a little bit different in the ICU to what we do in the ward. But what we all normally do in the ICU is to cut back to 500 calories over 24 hours. I think if you've got a very small patient, then maybe you should reconsider the 500 and you could possibly even go less. And then you go up in a stepwise approach um, as the patient's um, electrolytes normalizes. Um, and in these patients, it might sometimes be necessary to even do their blood more than once a day to make sure that, that we are on top of, of their supplementation. So why does it work to restrict their calories? Um, we don't really know, but um, hyperphosphatemia could lead to cellular dysfunction. And it has been found to be an independent risk factor for infection, sepsis, and shock. And then again, insulin resistance also contributes to, to infection and sepsis risk. Um, so the, the thinking is that it could be related to that. So if we then look at once we've got our patient through refeeding and we, we now need to meet requirements, what are we aiming for? So again, we've got the aspirin and the aspirin recommendations yeah so 
like I said, what we tend to follow a little bit closer is the, the ESPN recommendation. So um, ESPN breaks the, the recommendation up into an early phase and then a later phase. And the early phase really that they're referring to is the first kind of one to three days. Um, so in the early phase, we don't want to give the patient their full requirements, which is sometimes difficult if the patient tolerates their feed well, because it's just so easy to, to give it. Um, so what we should be aiming for in the first kind of three days or so 72 hours, about 20 to 25 calories per kilo. And then from there, you can start increasing um, your calories 25 to 30. Um, <clears throat> so they recommend hypocaloric feeding. And the reason for that is that the, the body will produce um, glucose which you and you can't turn that that production off um it's a survival method and if you then feed if the patient is producing x amount of of in, of um endogenous glucose and you feed him his full requirements on top of that you end up overfeeding the patient so that's why we we cut back for the calories and it's difficult really to know how much the patient is is producing for himself and i, I think in some cases especially when we have very malnourished patients, that patient might not even have the substrate to, to really do that. But then in that case, the patient will be a refeeding risk again. So it's then still um, wise to, to go a little bit slower. So then after about day three, you're going to start increasing the patient's requirements to 80 to 100% of their, of their energy expenditure. Ideally, we should be measuring this with, um, with indirect calorimetry. We've got indirect calorimeters. Um, so that's something that we, that we need to, to use more in our ICU patients and, and measure at, at regular intervals. Um, Aspen says something similar, 25 to 30 calories, and to advance to goal over 24 to 48 hours. And to your, the aim is then to provide more than 80% of your requirements by, by 48 to 72 hours. So more or less about day three, you want to be providing 80% or, or more of your patient's requirements. <coughs> we follow ESP. Yeah. Sorry. Um, with regard to the, so the insulin resistance, has anyone tried to study the benefits of like, sensitizing their intake? In, in, in refeeding syndrome? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. I haven't, I haven't seen any studies with that. So then if we come to, to protein requirements, um, so the Aspen guidelines is 1.2 to 2 grams um, per kilogram actual body weight. And then you need to, to evaluate your patient constantly to see whether you should provide more. Um, at the higher end of those requirements, the two is really reserved for your patients with burns, multi trauma, your open abdomens, um, where, there's, where there's also more losses. The Eastern guidelines says that you should provide at least 1.3 grams per kilogram of protein equivalent, which is fine if we're feeding a whole feed, um, like a, a polymeric feed. But if you've got a patient on a similar mental feed or TPN where you are feeding amino acids, um, 100 grams of protein hydrolysate only gives you 83 grams of amino acids. So um, in, that, in that instance, you need to, to aim a little bit higher. So what, what we are doing now is we basically take the amount that the, the TPN bag gives us and we times it by 0.83 and that will give you the amount of actual protein that, that you're giving your, your patient. So it's just important to keep in mind that if you're feeding a semi mental feed or you're feeding TPN, you need to aim a little bit higher um, with, your, with your protein. Um, then in terms of the route of nutrition support, um, the Aspen guidelines suggest that EN should be start within 24 to 48 hours in a critically ill patient um, who is unable to eat orally. Um, and we should withhold it until the patient is fully resuscitated and or stable. Um, the Aspen guidelines suggest that if oral diet is not possible, we should start early EN within 48 hours in critically ill patients. Um, and we should rather started instead of, of um, delaying enteral feed in these patients. So there's a lot of, of similarity on that where, the, where there's more controversies when we start PN in these patients. So we should not start PN before, before all other strategies to maximize EN tolerance has been attempted. Um, so if you are unable to establish enteral nutrition, um, that would be something like a high output fistula or stoma or high gastric residual volumes, or where there's a contraindication um, to EN. 
we should then consider um, parental nutrition support. Um, when should we initiate it? So the Aspen guideline says if your patient is at low risk, you don't have to worry for about the first week. They can lie there, <laughs> not, receive, not receive nutrition support. If the patient is at high risk or severely malnourished, then we should start being as soon as possible. Aspen in that regard is a little bit different. And that's where, where we as dietitians very much like to follow the Aspen guideline. So they say that it should be implemented within three to seven days. And in that case, we kind of focus a little bit more on the three, um, especially then, and then they agree with Aspen if your patient is severely malnourished. But what is important is that we shouldn't start early food being in patients in the, in the very um, early phase of, of ICU. So it's obviously easier to get being into a patient because they're not going to vomit or have diarrhea or anything like that. Um, I mean, you write up the rate and it, and it goes, but it's important to, to not um, provide the patient for the, for the full being early. So I think it's, it's much easier if it's clear cut, your patient's either gonna be on EN or the patient's gonna require PN, but there is also kind of an area in the middle for, for supplemental PN and when we should consider that. So um, the Aspen guideline says that after 7 to 10 days, if your patient is not meeting at least 60% of the enteral nutrition, you should start supplemental PN. Um, the Aspen guideline says if the patient is not tolerating within the first week, we should consider PN on a case-by-case -case basis. So there might be an instance where a patient is tolerating a, a small amount of enteral nutrition, but if you go up, the gastric residual volumes go up, or the intra-abdominal pressure goes up, or the patient develops diarrhea, and then we don't have to stop that enteral nutrition because you're still going to get some of the benefit um, by maintaining the gut, by feeding the patient enterally, but then you make up the, the remainder of the energy and protein requirement with PN, and um, that, that's what, what they refer to then as supplemental PN. So when should we not give PN? So early in the acute phase of severe sepsis or septic shock, in hemodynamic instability and in patients who are able to tolerate sufficient EN, PN should not be given. So PN is not a, a quick fix to, to quickly optimize a patient. Um, and then when should PN be weaned? If the amount of the PN can be reduced and then stopped, if the patient is able to at least tolerate 60% of their target um, enteral nutrition. All right, so if we then, move over a little bit to very operative um, management and these are the the ESPEN surgical guidelines so the guideline is the perioperative nutrition therapy should be initiated if the patient is going to be unable to eat for more than five days in the perioperative period or if the patient is expected to have low oral intake um, or cannot maintain more than 50 percent of his intake for more than seven days and that sh this should then be done preferably via the enteral um, route, which includes EN or PN, uh, EN or ONA, sorry. Um, and we, we shouldn't delay that process. So if energy requirements cannot be meet, met orally um, or with enteral intake alone, so that's less than 50% more than seven days, then supplemental PN should be initiated in these patients. Or if there's a contraindication to EN, something like an obstruction or an ileus, um, Shock should probably not really be there. Intestinal ischemia, high output fistulas, or severe um, intestinal hemorrhages. That patient should be considered for should be considered for, for perioperative PN. Um, and then patients with severe nutritional risk should receive nutritional therapy prior to major surgery, even if the surgery and this includes um, surgery for cancer needs to be delayed, and that um, you need to feed that patient then for at least seven to fourteen days. So this is also especially important in something like an ERAS program, for instance. Um, if a patient is, is malnourished, the, the surgery should not um, take preference over nutritional optimization, unless it's, of course, an emergency um, type of surgery. So then in terms of preoperative um, fasting, so if there isn't a specific risk for, for aspiration, we should allow patients to take clear fluids up until two hours prior to the anesthetic. And we are providing patients with a glucose containing um, drink in the, in the wards that's implemented ERAS um, to take up to two hours before, uh, or they can take solids up until six hours before the, 
the anesthetic or it's four hours for breast milk if, if it's if it's a child um, patients who are intubated on a tube feed who is not going to to have the airway manipulated we should not stop their feeds um, prior to to surgery and then patients who are receiving post pyloric feeds even if they are not intubated um, should not have the the feeds um, stopped because that patient is not a risk for, for aspiration um, then after surgery, oral intake should be continued without interruption in most cases, but it should be adapted according to the tolerance of the patient and the type of surgery. Um, and in most patients, oral intake can be initiated within hours after surgery. So that whole thing of ice chips and sips and then clear fluids, full fluids, that we don't really do that um, in surgery anymore. Um, there, there is your patients, the ones with, with major head and neck, um, or upper GI kind of surgeries where, where we're not going to be feeding the patient um, orally, but in those cases, enteral nutrition should be initiated. And there it's important to have that discussion with the, with the surgeon to place a nasogeginal tube or do a feeding jejunostomy for that patient at the time of surgery. Um, and then also, I think in, a, in the ERAS approach, we sometimes lose... We're so focused on that there shouldn't be any catheters and tubes and IV lines and things going into patients that we become hesitant to feed those patients enterally. But a nasogastric um, tube to feed a patient with to provide nutrition is very different to a nasogastric tube that we put in for decompression, which is what ERA says not to play. So if you've got a patient who is obviously malnourished at the time of surgery, but has to go for his surgery. We know that patient's not going to eat well after surgery. A nasogastric tube um, will, still, will still give you a lot of benefit there. And we then start slowly and um, increase according to, to tolerance. So this, uh, we don't do small bowel transplants here, but I've just put this in here, that even after a small intestinal transplant, Ian can be initiated early. So to say you can't feed a patient because they've got a an anastomosis is, is not, <laughs> that's not a contraindication to, to enteral feeds. Um, if you can feed a patient after a small bulb transplant, I think in most cases, a feed can be started. <clears throat> so when should we consider, uh, consider nasogeginal tubes, like we've said before, for patients who have undergone um, major upper GI surgery or pancreas surgery. Um, and then if you know that a patient's going to be on feed for long term, which in the European guidelines to define is more than four weeks, um, they recommend to replace a peg, which is not really something that, that we do often um, in our setting. Um, I think there would be a lot of patients in ICU with pegs if we, if we had to go according to the four weeks, but um, a peg is not, not without complications. So we, we leave patients on, on tube feeds for, for longer. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation.